Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming here on your lunch break. Just wanted to give you a couple notes on Irina Dronova. She's actually a past Delta Science Fellow, so she was in the cohort of 2013 to 2014. So just goes to show you they all eventually come back here. Um, Irina is an assistant professor at the Department of Landscape, Architecture, and Environmental Planning at UC Berkeley. She obtained her PhD from UC Berkeley in Environmental Science Policy and Management. Her research combines ecological science, GIS, and remote sensing to investigate multi-scale dynamics of human-dominated landscapes. One of her major present interests involves using spatial information about wetland landscape structure and change to better understand and model wetland ecosystem services, particularly in restored ecosystems. As part of this effort, her group is also developing remote sensing-based approaches for cost-effective monitoring of restored ecosystems, particularly here in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak. So um, I would like today to share with you some thoughts on using environmental heterogeneity as a landscape planning and management objective. And most of this research comes from my recent work in the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley, uh, but a lot of it also has relevance to the Delta projects that we do uh, with myself and my students, and I would like to share some thoughts on that as well. So the big um, motivation for this work is this question, to what extent can landscapes possess high ecological and societal value and be basically both multifunctional and aesthetically pleasing and available to the society? This question closely relates to this concept of multifunctional working landscapes, which are basically regions that somehow integrate economic priorities and human land uses with ecological and conservation objectives. And the important thing about this concept is that it also recognizes human prevalence and dominance on the landscape rather than sort of opposing humans and nature. And um, it becomes therefore incredibly relevant to the current world and um, landscapes that are becoming increasingly human dominated. I'm also going to frequently refer to the concept of ecosystem services, which basically are defined as human-centric benefits of ecosystems. They were formalized into a framework by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which happened in the early 2000s, and this framework recognizes, let me see if I can, sorry, work it out here. Um, this framework recognizes a couple of different categories, like provisioning services, such as food, water, regulating services, such as uh, regulation of climate, cultural services, which have a lot of subcomponents, including um, spiritual, recreational, and aesthetic, which I'll spend some time talking about today as well, and then supporting services, which are a little bit more like ecosystem function necessary to support all of these. Um, current literature also recognizes the need to see these services as bundles and basically um, increasingly trying to inform management and planning in such a way that single decisions, single actions could lead to multiple services at once that are related and could be robustly provided rather than just focusing on one at a time. So with that, here is a brief outline of my talk. I'm first going to talk a little bit about heterogeneity, what it means, and in what ways it could be useful in the context of landscape management and planning. I'd like to spend some time speaking specifically about human perception of environment and aesthetic and cultural services that are becoming increasingly relevant in human-dominated landscapes. And then I'll bring it back to the Delta and talk about the relevance of these issues to some of the thoughts about the Delta's future. So environmental heterogeneity, um, again, it's a very important concept and could be a really useful objective for landscape planning and management for a number of reasons. I um, explored some of this issue in a recent synthesis paper that I published last year in Landscape and Urban Planning, and um, it's not a simple concept. Obviously, the term itself sounds very broad, and uh, if we look into the literature, there are a lot of different ways to define heterogeneity. In a spatial sense, for example, we can see, think of heterogeneity as biological diversity, as the diversity of communities, species on the landscape, as a variety of land cover types and land uses, as topographic or hydrological complexity, as vertical complexity of plant structure, and so on. There's also a temporal dimension to it, um, such as seasonality of plants or, for example, hydrological flows in the delta, as well as longer-term changes that could be sometimes manifested in, for example, presence of different successional stages or different kind of stages of land cover and land use transformations. But ultimately, all of them contribute to this idea of environmental complexity. 
that can further influence diversity of natural resources, diversity of responses to disturbance and hazards, and also visual heterogeneity and complexity that affects the way people perceive the landscapes and appreciate um, landscapes themselves as well as management decisions. So let's look more specifically into why is heterogeneity important as a subject for both research and um, management and planning. Um, well, for one thing, it often provides a common ground between multiple ecosystem services, again, enabling us to think about them as bundles, as sort of coupled benefits that we can achieve from single management accidents or land use decisions. Here I have a couple of brief examples. For example, diversity of flowering plants can produce a diversity of pollinators and associated food and trophic relationships, as has been shown by a number of empirical studies in ecological research in different ecosystems. Together, that can contribute to more effective retention of moisture and nutrients by plants, also greater productivity, utilization of ecological niches and resources, and as a result, greater ecological stability and um, greater recovery, uh, greater ability to recover from perturbation. Similar examples can be also found in, for example, coastal wetlands, where the complexity of elevation, topography, hydrological regimes, tidal inundation schedules can produce a variety, a really complex heterogeneous mosaic of microhabitats, microclimates, and associated plant communities. And that can also create a variety of conditions that enable different, for example, bird food guilds um, or other animals in their habitats, and again, promote a greater diversity of responses in the face of perturbation. So seeing this kind of uh, overlapping benefits is very important because by restoring, for example, tidal marshes, we can achieve these multiple benefits at once, and we can justify their value from more than just one ecological perspective. Some other arguments in favor of heterogeneity and its importance also come, interestingly, from the field of environmental psychology and um, broader sort of social sciences examining how people perceive the landscape. There are a lot of theories on that, and there's a lot of evidence finding that humans do appreciate the complexity of the environment around them. And one of the theories explaining this, for example, connects it to the evolutionary basis of human existence and survival and the diversity of natural resources. Basically, the idea is that if we see a diverse and heterogeneous landscapes, we can mentally identify a variety of potential food areas, hunting grounds, and areas of seasonal activity, and that all of them promote survival, and that's somehow ingrained in our kind of human memory. Um, other theories explore this concept of prospect and refuge. Um, it was a book published about this by Jay Ableton back in 1975 talking about how for a sense of comfort and environmental appreciation, humans need both a sense of prospect or opportunity, so again, exposure to some kind of variety of resources, but also refuge or shelter, which um, is also kind of part of the environmental complexity. So when I try to envision this idea of prospect and refuge, I think about a forest edge where I have sort of like a forest behind my back and some kind of vista with a lot of different ecosystems in it in front of me. And that also brings up this idea of heterogeneity. There's also a lot of current research showing that not only these values may be indeed related to the actual human preferences and what people perceive as visual quality or environmental quality, but also many of them vary among subject groups. They can vary with um, social, demographic factors such as age or kind of the childhood conditions. But they can also vary with environmental awareness and education, and that means that they could be influenced using environmental education and um, communication about um, environmental management and decisions. If we take both this idea of sort of multi-ecosystem service bundles and these uh, psychological responses, we can often find that certain ecological phenomena and processes indeed relate to both dimensions that may seem at first disconnected. Taking again flowering species diversity as an example and the diversity of pollinators, they have huge value in, for example, landscape architecture and design by promoting the diversity of colors, the diversity of visually attractive subjects, and so on. Topographic variety is also praised by promoting the sense of openness, depth, and visual complexity. Edges and ecotones are not only biologically and ecologically rich and diverse um, elements of natural landscapes, but they can also be seen as something very important for scenic value by providing, again, visual heterogeneity and also legibility and focal points for the human eye. Um, and same applies to temporal aspects as well. You know, a lot of seasonal phenomena that are critical for nutrient cycling, for biogeochemical processes such as, for example, full leaf um, uh, color changes in deciduous species 
are also praised for their aesthetic value. And so what's interesting in this for me is that, again, you know, if we look at the literature on aesthetic quality and aesthetic elements of landscapes and ecosystem services, they don't always very clearly or obviously talk to each other, and yet they're often talking about very similar phenomena that, again, provide some of these opportunities for bridging these different priorities when it comes to complex management decisions and different stakeholders. Another really interesting and important aspect that comes from the recent literature is the connections between heterogeneity and resilience. Before recently, you know, since mid-90s, I would say, there was a lot of literature showing the importance of biodiversity for resilience, and there were a number of field ecological studies showing that higher levels of species richness, for example, promote faster rate of recovery since perturbation. Nowadays, resilience is a very important concept. It's a popular buzzword, and we hear it in various contexts, and almost the holy grail for landscape planning. It's defined basically as both the ability to withstand disturbance and the ability to recover following perturbations. But there's also recent evidence that not only biodiversity per se, but also other landscapes of environmental complexity can promote heterogeneity. And the key reason for this is, again, this diversity of responses. Uh, there are famous examples in the um, study of forest um, responses to fire, and I'm citing here Gabrielle uh, paper um, on, on that, uh, the idea being that if you have a landscape with a lot of nested forest mosaics of different age stages, different successional stages, a fire coming through that landscape will not affect it equally. And in fact, in some cases, it might be even slowed down by, for example, high density of really young plants and other things. And so that mosaic can, again, alleviate some of the catastrophic fire impacts much more effectively than a landscape that's uniformly managed and is very homogenous and similar. There are other examples in wetlands. There are not a lot of studies in wetlands, but some interesting studies showing responses to extreme salinity as a perturbation. And similar examples are also coming from human-dominated systems. For example, in diversified agriculture. Diversified agriculture basically is the idea of management where we have uh, practices like crop intermixing or inclusion of hedgerows, remnant habitats, um, maybe even uh, introducing uh, species that are not relevant to crops themselves but promote pollinators, biological pest controls. And there is, again, a lot of empirical evidence showing that together these measures can promote greater yield, greater agricultural productivity, and greater resilience to various kinds of disturbance. So that also speaks in the favor of heterogeneity as this kind of objective. Now, this all is interesting, but then it brings up a question of then how much heterogeneity is enough? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, how much heterogeneity is then enough for a given management objective? From the ecological and ecosystem science perspective, we are actually getting better at answering this question due to a variety of tools. We can use field experiments to determine certain levels of, for example, plant diversity associated with certain level of productivity or ecological stability. There's also an increasing application of computer-based modeling that gives us opportunities to test a greater variety of scenarios and answer these questions. However, from the perspective of human perception and this kind of aesthetic and cultural ecosystem services, it's not as simple. Uh, human perception studies show a variety of responses of people to different levels of complexity. Many of them tend to converge on this idea of intermediate complexity, which sounds really vague, but here I have a brief example that sort of um, loosely illustrates the point. So uh, a landscape that has some of moderately spaced vegetation and maybe a standalone tree with some additional elements of vegetation in the background would be um, perceived more favorable than a landscape with high variety of species and vegetation types that are much more complex and messy, and there are a lot of them. In fact, messy is a term that is very popular in landscape um, architecture and design when it comes to sort of excessive complexity. Um, part of the reason is that um, apparently uh, humans really value neatness and order on the landscape. Um, again, um, environmental psychologists explain it by the fact that we are limited in our ability to process information, and when the human brain experiences a lot of visual information, excessive amounts of it can cause certain confusion. But of course, there are also practical aspects of management and maintenance and so on. And I'd like to uh, cite here a paper that was published a long time ago in 1995 by Joanna Sauer, who is a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Michigan, but it remains very pertinent um, nowadays. And this was this idea that if we'd like to introduce ecosystem function through various actions, especially 
very human dominated landscapes, like for example, urban areas, we might be more successful if we do it using orderly frames, basically literally geometric layouts or landscape design approaches that introduce more order and become more culturally recognizable to people. This was the time in the mid-90s when ecological design was really gaining speed and people were actively searching ways to bridge these sort of aesthetic and cultural values with the needs to remedy certain environmental risks or um, introduce more specific habitat, uh, ecosystem function, and connectivity on the landscape. And this paper basically discussed um, this strategy as one of the ways to bring together these diverse objectives. However, we also know, unfortunately, in a hard way, that orderly frames alone sometimes create additional risks and um, issues that we have to solve at sometimes even higher cost than creating them in the first place. Cities are great examples of orderly frames with a lot of geometry, architectural principles, kind of promoting those frames and uh, construction materials that we know all contribute to urban thermal hazards and extreme heat in cities that is becoming a health issue recognized more and more as urban regions expand globally. Another example of orderly frames is the lawn, the kind of classical lawn that typically uses non-native species and in a lot of traditional maintenance practices requires chemicals that can be harmful to people, to other animals and uh, plants and um, life and uh, the society may or may not always even realize this value but there's a lot of, again, research on the subject. In more extreme scenarios, orderly frames often fail in the face of natural disasters, as again, we're learning with hard ways. This is an example of a location in Gilchrist, Texas, that was badly hit by Hurricane Ike in 2008. And on the right, you see the, what this landscape looked in Google Earth, a historical imagery right the year before, at a similar time of the year. So again, um, a lot of uh, traditional design practices and orderly frames that are not necessarily able to deal with the scope of disasters. So what all of this means is that the societal value of certain principles guiding perception is, remains very important both in the eyes of the broader public and in the eyes of landscape architecture and design communities serving us. And the costs associated with these decisions are not necessarily obvious to us even when they happen in such extreme scenarios in part because these costs and the net outcomes of these decisions have really not been assessed all that extensively in the literature and in the kind of relevant research. I have an example here from a recent literature synthesis that is currently under review. Basically, this was a review of reviews. I tried to look at the various papers reviewing progress in the ecosystem service research today, and I was interested in how much these cultural and aesthetic services in particular are represented among these fields. And uh, what we're seeing is that only about one-third of the papers in this review really talks Sorry, really talks about these issues explicitly. In most cases, very briefly, but enough to convey the nature of a service. Another third uh, here mentions them very briefly, sometimes only in the abstract or introduction. And then another roughly third, 35%, um, don't talk about them at all. However, when we look at the subject areas where these discussions are presented, there is a remarkable diversity of subjects, um, not only in human dominated landscape contexts such as urban ecosystems or agroecosystems, but also in the fields of terrestrial, wildland ecosystems, um, aquatic systems, animal ecology, as well as broader concepts, methods, and policy conservation, and even sustainable energy field. So the topic is clearly relevant to a broad variety of disciplines, especially as um, kind of the applied science is um, considered um, as a provider of solutions for some of these questions. But there's still underrepresented for the most part. And the reasons for this underrepresentations are several. One of them, I think, is the, just the vagueness and the subjectivity of definitions. It's very difficult to study human perception um, among the variety of subjects and the cultural and um, demographic complexity that a lot of countries have these days. Nevertheless, there is some interesting efforts towards making more objective and replicable metrics. Uh, some of them come from economics, environmental economics, like valuation and using metrics like willingness to pay and other economic indicators as objective ways to really understand the value of um, aesthetic services as well as other ecosystem services to society. There are a lot of work in landscape ecology and spatial ecology trying to develop metrics of landscape structure that could be also objectively related to scenic value and could be compared among um, regions that are highly appreciated for their environmental and scenic quality with others and so on. 
But from a perspective of an ecosystem scientist, it's a really difficult task, right? If we're focusing on a certain ecosystem service and we are not necessarily trained in environmental psychology or perception, adding this dimension is a huge layer of complexity. It could be also a significant part of research budget that may or may not be accommodated by a given funding venue. And um, it becomes essentially often a reason for ignoring them whatsoever. Um, I think it's time to think about this more as an opportunity for collaboration across the fields rather than sort of staying away from this because clearly uh, it is it's something that becomes very important to society. And to um, justify this point further, I want to talk a little bit about some of the risks of ignoring important aesthetic and cultural values that uh, kind of very intuitive if we think about this, but not necessarily obvious when it comes to a specific decision. There is interesting literature showing that ignoring ecosystem services um, from this aesthetic and human perception standpoint can pose serious barriers to restoration. River restoration, especially in the Western United States currently, for example, promotes the use of wood, like basically down logs and so on, as a way to promote additional habitat for fish and for aquatic invertebrates and uh, trophic chains. It turns out that this is often perceived very negatively by people experiencing landscapes with a lot of wood in the water, as well as residents who live next to the areas affected by restoration. I already mentioned lawn chemicals as another uh, very important health hazard, but um, that is not the only outcome of popular landscape practices. One other very obvious um, issue is the use of invasive plant species in horticulture and nurseries and markets, even when they're already known to be registered invasive in a given location. And they are very, very popular in landscape design. Often they provide important options for um, kind of achieving the desired visual effect. And there is a lot of literature recently discussing how they have an important cultural value. And um, therefore, uh, perhaps we should stop labeling them as negative and start really accepting their inevitability. What is interesting about that literature is that it often talks about value, but it rarely talks about the actual cost of it or rarely assesses this as well. And that is also a really important part of this controversy. Another risk potentially resulting from ignoring aesthetic perception and value is this sense of alienation from nature, which basically is kind of public disengagement that can result from important but aesthetically unfavorable decisions. One example that is um, coming in the literature and we probably experienced a lot in the recent years is, for example, the need to reduce irrigation during extreme droughts because that can lead to senescence of ornamental plants and sort of make the lawns and other elements of landscape look quite different from what they were intended. Here I have a view uh, from Mount Diablo Trail looking down at the residential area during the extreme drought in July 2015. And you can see that everything is sort of, the oaks are green, and then there is, sorry, there is the dry annual grassland, and then there is a very, very green golf course. Of course, um, it's difficult for the golf course to stop irrigation because of the public image and the amenities that they provide to people. And this kind of creates, again, contributes to some of these controversies. Another example is when protecting vulnerable species requires homogeneous habitat or even public exclusion, until at least temporarily, which can also make people feel like they're disconnected and they're excluded from something going on in nature and contributes to this controversy. Sometimes the sense of alienation may be even more nuanced. I'm going to use another example published 20 years ago that also I think it remains quite pertinent today. Um, it was a study done by one of my colleagues, Professor Louise Mazingo at UC Berkeley, and um, it was basically uh, dis discussing various aspects of kind of science and culture. But one of the examples this paper discussed was this West Pond in uh, Davis, uh, which is in the city of Davis, just very close to where we are, is right outside of the Delta boundary. So this was a detention pond that was designed to have a little bit of like public walkability, but also provide habitat for birds. And this is um, a screenshot from the eBird, and you can see there was quite a lot of different bird sighting and reports, so obviously the birders like this site, and uh, there is a bird, bird, birds are using it, which is great news. But um, at that time also, this was one of these early examples of ecological design intended to, again, bring together human values. And there is a residential area surrounding this landscape right here. And uh, ecological values and the need to support biodiversity and habitat and such. And a lot of landscape architecture studios in the region have started to bring the students there and discuss and sort of um, evaluate this design. And what's interesting here is that the kind of consensus seemed to be that this landscape, unless the birds were present, was perceived as incredibly dull. And uh, furthermore, this paper quotes another paper published around the same time that apparently surveyed the residents and talked how um, 
the property values went up in the area after this wildlife pond was created, but they could have gone up maybe even more if this was a golf course instead. This is a much more nuanced discussion and controversy, but I think, again, it clearly illustrates that these um, perception-based values, these aesthetic services, sometimes not in an obvious way, can still be very, very important and affect the attitude and the progress of the measures that could be promoted for reasons that are also intended to be very important for people and solve important problems such as, for example, flood hazard prevention. Coming from environmental science, I often find myself thinking it's almost a luxury to think about aesthetics when we have all these important problems to solve. But now I'm finding that maybe um, rather than thinking about this as a luxury, we can find ways to utilize this to the human advantage and use aesthetic value and its connectedness with other ecosystem services as the way to promote them and promote important measures that we feel are necessary and important to achieve these multiple values in the working landscape context. One of the missing puzzle pieces to make that happen, I think, is the lack of research, as I mentioned earlier, the underrepresentation of the subject. It seems like this is shifting. So from the same literature review, these are some statistics on papers published in recent years across these different subject areas. And you can see that basically overall there is more literature and discussion of aesthetic services, and it's not just happening in the context of urban or agricultural systems, but also in the context of other human-dominated landscapes. If you have been at the State of the Estuary Conference this past fall, I really enjoyed the presentation by Michael Bowen from the Presidio Trust, who also spoke about the need to bring the eye of a designer into the final stage of restoration projects and to help people connect with these projects better and understand their ecological importance. And it doesn't mean opening up vulnerable sites to the public to be trampled or something like that, but it means identifying those crucial nodes of opportunity where people can be more easily connected with the sites, have basically certain aesthetic outcomes and maybe educational, spiritual as well, of enjoying this experience and using that to promote and teach about these important values that are also affecting people in the way people don't necessarily understand. So with that, I'd like to bring this back to the Delta and talk a little bit about heterogeneity and the Delta future. So I enjoy going back to the Delta plan as a reference when it comes to some of the active research, which I'll also mention in a moment. And this is a quote from uh, the Delta plans a vision about the Delta future with some of my highlighting and kind of bold font used. So when I read this, there are a lot of aspects of the vision for the future of the Delta that resonate with the notion of heterogeneity, a reference to diversity of native species and habitats, environmental and hydrological variation, including hydrological flows, the seasonality of which is very important for both aquatic and terrestrial systems in the Delta connectivity, which promotes heterogeneity and variety, and the diversity of human experiences and the way humans can be engaged in the Delta as well. And I should also mention that even though we often talk about the Delta as a system that lost a lot of its historical complexity, as clearly shown by wonderful historical ecology or efforts such as the SFEI historical ecology study, there is still a lot of heterogeneity and complexity in the Delta. There are uh, different parcels of land and different kinds of land uses. There are regions with different degrees of incoming urbanization that also have very sort of local influence and potentially uh, with more far-reaching consequences in the future. There is seasonality and temporal complexity of hydrological regimes and human activity in the Delta. And even if we look at this broad agricultural region that people often think, well, it's, most of it is just agriculture, there is also a lot of heterogeneity there not just in terms of crop diversity, but also in terms of, for example, factors such as subsidence. This is a screenshot from another SFEI recent publication, Adult Renewed, that shows how in this predominantly agricultural part of the Delta, there is actually a lot of variability in the degree of subsidence and time required to reach current intertidal levels. And that, to me, also indicates a diversity of context for restoration and potentially diversity of measures might be promoted to either restore um, uh, soils and peatlands and ecosystems or even have a variety of completely different ecosystems associated with these different levels of the current um, state of the landscape. Promoting heterogeneity in the Delta is often discussed, again, through the prism of biodiversity, conservation, ecological and functional connectivity. I think there's also a lot of opportunities in the human-dominated part of the Delta, regardless of what specific pathway happens and what sort of broader land use and management decisions occur, agriculture is likely to be there for some time and play a really key role in, in these various ecosystem services. And there are a lot of opportunities, again, for diversified farming systems that could be potentially, in some cases, even 
being bridged with uh, wetland ecosystems or aquaculture, but also in themselves. They could be potentially rethought to include greater diversity of habitat for pest controls and pollinators, um, using this to an advantage to the farmers themselves, but also promote novel kinds of human connectivity and infrastructure, such as agricultural tourism and ecological tourism that does it. And this human connectivity is also something that is, I think, is critically needed and could be um, um, could be also promoted through a variety of experiences involving both what we think of as natural and human parts of the delta. I'd like to talk about restoration for a little bit as well. Um, this is a screenshot from EcoAtlas that shows this amazing kind of new database of restoration projects that are starting to be consolidated now and we are more easily able to gain access to their information and start comparing them. Uh, some of um, Research efforts in my group currently focus on the new restoration projects in the uh, freshwater um, setting in the West Delta um, designed by the Department of Water Resources to promote multiple ecosystem services. This is a really great example of these co-benefits and bundles of services uh, that can be achieved with a single type of a project. They're primarily intended for carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas regulation with the idea that perhaps they could be participants in cap and trade programs and help even save themselves in the future. But through that productivity, through that sequestration, they also can uh, have the potential to rebuild the soil and peat accretion and therefore reverse subsidence, or at least counteract it. To an extent, they also provide incredible amount of habitat for different kinds of wildlife, as well as other opportunities for humans and um, components of natural ecosystems. And what's interesting is that we know these benefits, we're really excited about them, but we don't necessarily always know the extent to which they are indeed provided by the systems. And the lack of monitoring and restoration in general is a well-known problem, not only in the wetland region such as Delta, but also in, in a variety of other contexts. It's very difficult to monitor restoration projects for a number of reasons. Budgets are often limited and you kind of want to put most of it to make a really good effort. The time frames for restoration are also frequently limited to three or five years, in some cases 10 years, but they're fixed and they're usually predetermined. And as a result, um, at least in early stages when these systems may behave like absolutely novel ecosystems, not at all like they're natural prototypes, we don't always know these outcomes very well and we don't have a, a way to quantify them. And with wetlands, there's an additional complexity of limited field access. It's very difficult to collect the data necessary to answer these questions. So I think this is where we can take some advantage of remote sensing technology, like satellite images, aerial images, drones that are becoming increasingly accessible, and there are a lot of various initiatives providing these data. Here are just some examples from my group using these data to help us better understand the restoration outcomes. Um, on the left here is uh, some snapshots from the studies that we're using. Um, high-resolution aerial and satellite images to look at the changes in wetland landscape structure and habitat after restoration. This is my PhD student, Sophie Tadeo. She's also a current Delta Science Fellow. And uh, what's great about it is that it's very difficult to go into the field and trace all of these individual patches to understand where they are, how big they are, are they green, are they full of dead biomass. But remote sensing gives us a way to do this relatively cost-effectively and fast. And if we work with time series of data, we can look at this over time and see, okay, where are the patches extending? Where are they shrinking? What factors could be attributed to that? How, what is the vertical uh, complexity in the systems if we can bring data, for example, from lighter systems and so on? And that can also allow us to compare multiple projects in the regional context rather than just looking at them one by one. We can also use remote sensing data to model certain ecological variables. This is part of my uh, Delta Science project, and um, this work is still evolving. We published some of it already, and we keep adding new data and keep exploring these techniques. Modeling certain parameters of plant canopies that are relevant to ecosystem function modeling, again, using their relationships with remote sensing data. For this kind of work, you do have to go in the field and collect some of the data, but you can do it in a relatively limited sense and develop models that then could be applied to broader landscape and, again, in a more cost-effective way than relying on field work alone. Um, another direction that I'm really excited about is through our collaboration with UC Berkeley's Biometeorology Lab, led by Professor Dennis Baldocki, and his student uh, Kyle is also a Delta Science Fellow at the moment. So this group has been performing long-term measurements of greenhouse gas fluxes in different ecosystems, including a set of wetlands in the Delta. So they put the equipment um, in the field that is able to measure kind of real-time and high-frequency concentrations of CO2, methane, water vapor, and perform a variety of other measurements to understand whether 
in the kind of long run, these ecosystems act as sinks on the net or sources, or does it change seasonally, annually, and so on. But wetlands present a really new and interesting challenge to this kind of research. Historically, methods and equipment for this type of analysis have been developed in systems like forest and agricultural fields that could be assumed relatively homogenous. So when these measurements are being collected, the spatial footprint of the area that contributes to the data detected by the sensor can really vary in time, depending on wind, humidity, time of the day, and so on. If the system is homogenous, we don't worry about that usually. We think we're still sort of more or less sampling the same type of ecosystems. But with wetlands, there is inherent complexity and patchiness, which means that when we interpret this data, we don't usually know exactly whether it's because of something happening, for example, with plants right next to the site that we're looking at, or because the size of this footprint includes too much open water at the moment. And disentangling this two is very, very difficult if we only look at the signature from one data, kind of from one field measurement point station. But if we bring remote sensing data, particularly this new high resolution imagery, we can model the footprint more explicitly. We can also do time series analysis of plant phenology, changes in water, changes in maybe algae and other things. And we can relate this to help better interpret this data and understand the implications for carbon budgeting and also for the overall performance of these restoration projects. On the broader regional scale, there are also new platforms like Google Earth Engine. You may have heard about it. It's basically a web-based programming interface developed by Google that um, allows us to connect to a lot of freely available satellite images and other spatial data. And we can develop a code for one site and run it on multiple sites or the whole planet if the data allow. And the, the only thing you need is a web browser with internet connection. This is a huge breakthrough for researchers like myself coming from the spatial science background because it eliminates the need to pre-process the data, download it, clip it, erase it, and so on. And we can just focus on the raw data. We can mosaic it on the fly. And we can develop these techniques to explore seasonality, time series patterns, and um, then develop quantitative models for other metrics that we're interested in. So it's a really exciting new era for that as well. And there are, in addition to Google, there are other initiatives um, providing similar capabilities at the moment. In thinking about all of these directions, I realized more and more that um, to help use these findings more effectively for thinking about Delta future and both local and regional scale management, we also have some missing pieces that we should start thinking about addressing in the nearest time. And one thing that I would personally really like to see happen would be the Delta-wide inventories of ecosystem services. We know a lot about ecosystem services in the Delta. Qualitatively, they have been described in a variety of literature and documentation. There are a lot of amazing research efforts studying specific services, such as, for example, greenhouse gas sequestration and so on. But in a spatially explicit sense, we still don't have, I think, a clear picture of where exactly they are, how much are they providing, are they available seasonally or annually all the time or only sometimes, and um, what is the nature of their access, where, who's benefiting from them. Agricultural services are often exported, for example, right, the food uh, crops, yields, and so we don't always know um, how they are experienced by the public, local versus distant beneficiaries. And having this information in place could really help us to think more about their future provision, some of the strategic interventions with Delta, such as even placing restoration projects and intending to provide certain functions, and the broader meaning of landscape quality in the Delta to the public. So. Um, I think this is an important research need to better understand the distribution and also coupling and connectivity of these various ecosystem services. And it's not an easy task by all means, but I think it could really help us inform some of these decisions. And ideally, it should be also followed by some sort of economic valuation, which again is a very tricky task, not an easy task to do. But we see more and more examples of ecosystem service valuation, for example, in tropical forests and other complex landscapes. There are a lot of tools, such as, for example, Invest a software platform areas, there are other kind of programs embedded into spatial software. There's a lot of effort to develop tools. Not all of them are suitable to landscapes such as Delta immediately, but they could potentially be adapted. And that, again, could help us understand the distribution of these services, the areas that are perhaps undercovered or underrepresented, and opportunities for bringing people into this discussion more via various kinds of public engagement. In doing this, again, I would like to say that it's really important not to overlook the importance of cultural and aesthetic services, not just because they matter to people and design community, but because in some cases they can provide outstanding opportunities for outreach, communication, and education. And in some cases, it could be really important but not obvious barriers to the measures that we're trying to promote. And um, 
this may sound really utopic, but when I think about the kind of the future Delta, I almost see like a national park map, like in a point raised somewhere with an infrastructure where people can know how to travel through the Delta, what are the interesting vista points, nodes to experience, opportunities to engage in various activities, except it's not a sort of a pristine wild ecosystem, but an active working human dominated landscape. And I think doing this sort of valuation and assessment of ecosystem services and their coupling could really help us ultimately come up with such an infrastructure, regardless of what specific management plan or path the Delta takes in the future. So with that, I'd like to summarize and just basically um, make a couple of final points. I think there's a lot of evidence that environmental heterogeneity provides a useful way not only to bring multiple ecosystem services together as bundles, but also to bridge those services that may seem completely disconnected on the first look, such as ecosystem function-related values and aesthetic values and public preferences. Again, strengthening these opportunities and the applications of heterogeneity really requires to looking at a full spectrum of ecosystem services, understanding where they are, and not ignoring some important aspects like, um, again, cultural and aesthetic values. And specifically for the Delta, I think it's the right time, the right time to think about the variety of services more holistically and integratively and perform a rigorous inventory and valuation of services to help inform future efforts and more strategically place and assess restoration projects. With that, I just would like to thank the Delta Science Funding for opening the world of the Delta to me and making it, um, helping me to make it an active research direction for me and for my students that will uh, stay in the future. Colleagues from the Department of Water Resources, um, colleagues at UC Berkeley, USGS, and a lot of student assistants who help us with the field work and so on. And thank you very much again for inviting me to speak today. I'll be happy to talk with you or please contact me later. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thanks for this great talk. A uh, question on uh, the, uh, the first uh, third of your presentation that where you sort of ex tried to explain that uh, uh, aesthetic and cultural values are hard to uh, quantify. Uh, to what extent uh, that you are aware of have these multiple you know, countries' happiness indices been able to be disaggregated to include the cultural and aesthetic values of the regions, countries, or, you know, at different scales uh, uh, so they can be teased out because the indices are made up of metrics and aesthetic and cultural values are definitely one of the many metrics that go into the, you know, the, the why Norway ranks the number one in the, in the world and the U.S. 37th or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, why would Norwegians want to come here? You know, so why, uh, what, uh, how do you disaggregate these indices and uh, essentially create metrics that can be quantified? This is a really great question. I don't have an immediate answer for that because from what I see in the literature, the, the kind of the fields that are coming up with the indices for these like aesthetic versus other ecosystem values are often very disparate fields of the literature themselves. And they, in the, for the majority of the studies that I've encountered, they only look at certain aspects, but not necessarily all of them in the entirety. But some efforts that I think are trying to be more integrative are studies of um, economic value and willingness to pay. And this is basically done, this disaggregation happens through uh, very rigorous statistical approaches, such as hedonic regression or other kinds of like regression analysis where they try to basically see which factors, uh, even though they potentially might overlap in their meaning or other things, but which of them appear as statistically the strongest and most significant. And of course, there are all kinds of assumptions that go into that, and um, the interactions among them can also be tested statistically, but they don't necessarily, even if some of them stand out, it sometimes could be a function of your data or your sample rather than the, kind of the actual truth. And because there, the re efforts of this are still relatively new in the context of like very specific landscapes, I'm not aware of like, you know, the, the sort of the universal framework that would apply in a broad variety of contexts. But nevertheless, I think there's a lot of useful information and specific statistical techniques that could be borrowed to help that happen. Various kinds of factor analysis. I think we're also kind of living in the era where the data, at least in some regions, are becoming a little bit easier to get various kinds of data, including census, social, demographic. And I think there's some of these new statistical approaches and data mining techniques we can also learn to identify and disaggregate even when it's not obvious at first. Um, I think that's the best we can do for the moment, but it's a good starting point. 
Hi, John. Thank you very much, Irina. I really enjoyed your talk. And um, I really was intrigued by your idea of developing this inventory of ecosystem services across the Delta. Have you thought about which ecosystem services might be easiest to do or anything more, any other thoughts you have about how to try to approach that? Because it does seem like it would be a, a big challenge. And, and then also, have you thought about how you could do that with the cultural or aesthetic services that you identified as well? This is a great question. So this is a relatively new idea that has come up, and um, I, I don't even know if like a, a sort of, if it would take a really good team of people to tackle this challenge rather than an individual person, but I have some preliminary thoughts on that, just looking at the literature in other places. I think some of the easiest ones probably would be agricultural um, areas because they are already, like they're acting as sort of um, areas that generate some net economic value, and they're also associated with certain types of soil or other properties that is already somehow built in some of these frameworks that exist, like INVEST, for example. Wetland systems, aquatic systems are a little bit trickier. There are some ecosystem service valuation efforts in fisheries a lot, but they're not necessarily done at the scale or type of landscape as Delta represents at the moment. Nevertheless, again, that, that is something that could be brought into it. Um, and I think, so, um, I would like to, I'm less familiar with the specific techniques on this, only kind of that they exist and sort of what they are. But I'd like to specifically start exploring INVEST. Some of the people who are involved in the development of INVEST um, graduated from the same department as I did at UC Berkeley, and they presented before some of the early ideas of it. What is really interesting about INVEST is that it tries to take this kind of spatial explicit perspective, and apparently you can bring various kinds of um, geospatial data into it. And that also to me means that if we could develop accurate geospatial delta for the delta that will be locally kind of suited for representing this landscape um, and um, have accurate depictions of its land cover and land use, we could potentially then adapt these frameworks for the Delta specifically. Um, and then for the wetlands too, I think as we, a lot of these restoration projects like the ones I mentioned are relatively new, but some of them have been already underway for several years and uh, kind of provide new data as we speak. So I think with these advances in carbon marketing, carbon crediting, some of these values could also potentially be more easily quantified. I'm not myself doing that kind of work, but there are a lot of efforts in wetlands and other places because people trying to demonstrate that these projects can pay for themselves. And that often comes also to other values of habitat and some other things. There are sometimes ways to substitute, like you can say, okay, um, even if it's difficult to quantify the specific value of this ecosystem, but how much does it provide that otherwise would be costly to create elsewhere? And we can kind of use some of these analogies to help come up with a cost figure. With respect to cultural and aesthetic values, I think it's extremely difficult, as the literature shows. Nevertheless, um, I think um, this is where the collaboration with social scientists and environmental psychologists would be highly needed. There are a lot of examples of, and kind of a progression in the literature of how people assess these things. Sometimes they, in the kind of old times when this methodology was coming up in like 70s, 80s, it was done based on mostly photos. Like people would be shown a bunch of photos from different subject groups or like experience the landscape and then kind of rank different um, types of vistas based on their preference. And then the environmental psychologists would look at these complexity, eligibility, all these kind of criteria. Nowadays, we can um, do it in much more different ways. We, can, we have very good methodology for social serving. So the actual residents and people who experience Delta could be potentially subjects of a, uh, of a uh, survey and a large scope social study. There are also ways to test this in the computer environment by visualizing some, for example, future scenarios of the delta and showing it to the subjects. And there are a lot of studies trying to do that, like what scenario would people prefer or value just based on visual appearance. Again, this requires expertise in social science, but it's, it, it's not impossible. It's, it's certainly doable and there are great literature and methods already in place for that. It's just that we haven't quite done it so far. And I think the kind of the voice of the um, social sciences and public would be really, really important and help us understand what, what, do, what do people actually think about these techniques. And ultimately, that could be extended to some sort of um, willingness to pay assessment like uh, or other kind of cost-benefit evaluation that we could uh, convert to actual figures, at least approximately. It would be very hard to do this like super accurately, but to get at least a sense of how this could affect, I think it would be very interesting. Any other questions? 
Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just I'm sorry, one, one final point for, for John's question. I just thought, like, there are also some of these funding opportunities, like NSF coupled human nature systems, that could be really great platforms for bringing different people interested in this. And they always look for broader impact that could also work with some public engagement. So we just should start looking at these opportunities. Sorry, I can't stop <laughs> talking about this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.